And I'm Ben. And welcome to the Canon Theatres Group. Today we're going to take you on a lab tour to show you what it's like to be a grad student in the Canazetas group. So here we have where the preparation of all the samples begins, um, with the weighing out of the reactants. One thing that's unique to the Canazetas group is that we actually have an incredible variety of reagents to choose from, um, from pretty much the entire transition metal clock um, to certain metal binaries, and even within the glove boxes, um, a wide variety of rare earths. Here we have our glove boxes where we store all of our air sensitive reagents and materials. Um, solid state chemistry involves a lot of air sensitive reagents like rare earth metals, alkali metals, alkali earth metals, as well as any binaries or products that we might make that also have to be kept in a nitrogen atmosphere. Here Abhishek is handling a piece of pure barium. We also have elemental sodium and lithium and potassium in oil in the glove boxes so that we can run all sorts of alkali metal and alkali earth reactions. One of the things that's really unique about our lab is we run an ammonia reaction to target these alkali calcogenide products which are very hard to find um, in industry and very hard to make. We have a setup where we uh, dissolve alkali metals in liquid ammonia and slowly add our calcogenide. And so these materials react pretty vigorously, so we have to keep the whole setup at dry ice temperatures so that we can make starting materials for our reactions. So after you've gone ahead and loaded your reactants into your glass tube, it comes time to seal it. So what we have up here is two different sealing lines, and the idea is that you use um, the vacuum pumps with some cold, uh, cold temperatures to pull the vacuum, set up your tube onto the ceiling line, light a flame, and slowly melt the glass under vacuum until your tube has been sealed under vacuum pressure. this point, the tube's already sealed, so I just need to get it to come off, right? Press to finish off the top of the tube. And we're done. Here in the downstairs lab, um, when you finish putting your reactants in the tube and sealing your tubes. We have here what I like to call, we, we all like to call the furnace wall. Um, so one thing that's unique to our group is just the sheer capacity of how many reactions we can run. So we have all of these furnaces on this side. And then if we walk around to the other side, we also have all sorts of furnaces on the other side of this wall. So um, very rarely is there ever a time where all of the furnaces are being used. So you don't really have to worry about um, signing up for specific times to figure out and coordinate with others when to run your reactions. So in addition to all of our general use furnaces, we also have all sorts of more specialized furnaces, the more complicated ones. So for example, here we've got a two-zone furnace, which is especially important in our field of science, where we use a lot of crystal growth and analyze crystal structures. Um, so the two-zone furnace is used for chemical vapor transport, which just helps you grow better crystals. Um, you can see here, actually, we've got some gorgeous crystals here that have been grown using CBT. So speaking of having a wide variety of materials to work with, um, we also have certain designated areas if you're interested in toxic chemicals. Um, so specifically, if you're working with materials such as uh, mercury or arsenic or thallium, um, we have designated furnaces and uh, fume hoods for those kinds of reactors. In addition to our tube furnaces, which typically reach 1,200 Celsius, we have two high temperature instruments. Here's an arc melter, which literally uses electric discharge to melt materials up to temperatures of like 3,000 Celsius. Uh, similarly, we have an induction furnace, which uses um, magnetic coils to heat your sample in the middle up to 
2,000, 3,000 Celsius. So whatever the temperature range, we have the instruments to, to get you to do the experiments that you need to do. Our group is also heavily applications based, so we make materials for projects. And so um, one of the important aspects of this field is crystal growth of large millimeter to centimeter sized crystals. So here we have Bridgman furnaces, which is a popular technique used to grow large single crystals. So we have these big drums, and so we reach a certain temperature, and the drums slowly move downward at you know millimeters per hour in order to get a good slow uh, growth of your large single crystal in your of your material. If you're wondering why it's so loud down here, we have a second mini flex in the downstairs labs. We have a chiller running to make sure our instrument stays cool and our x-rays stay safe. Uh, but we have uh, powder x-ray capabilities with two instruments and two single crystal instruments. So we have all the instruments. Here Xiaotong is prepping a sample for measurement by powder x-ray diffraction. She has a really nice red perovskite and she's gonna load that onto one of the masks and then it will be ready to run in our in-house instrument. So here's our uh, powder x-ray diffractometer. Xiaotong is loading her sample up, ready to be analyzed by the instrument. And in a few minutes, she'll know what the, the structure pattern of her material is. So in this upstairs room, in the same room as the upstairs Miniflex diffractometer, uh, we also have two single crystal diffractometers in-house of our own. Um, so you can see here, if we actually take a look at the insides, um, how you load your sample is you take your goniometer head and you uh, have a glass tip, you put your crystal on top, and then when you run the instrument, you can also take a look using the software, um, to check out certain frames, check out diffraction, etc. So although we do have instruments in MSERC downstairs, uh, we also just have two in-house, so you don't necessarily need to wait in line to run single crystal diffraction. So this is the lab where we do solution synthesis, focused mainly on hybrid halide perovskites. And here we have some crystals growing slowly on the hot plate. And you can see these nice yellow crystals growing. Um, halide perovskites are interesting materials for different optoelectronic applications, so we can make them into film. And we have over here our spin coder, uh, where we're able to make films of these materials in avian air. And also we have this ozone cleaner that helps um, make sure that the glass substrates are clean and ready for film fabrication. And we also have these, um, the spin coder and the hot plates to make films in a glove box as well, which we'll show you next. And we have some more cool gadgets to help grow bigger hybrid halide perovskite crystals, like these furnaces here, as well as another station here for uh, crystal growth. And now you can see if you do go through all these steps, what kind of hybrid halide crystals we get here, which are pretty nice and big and beautiful. <laughs> and these are, for example, methyl ammonium lead chloride and methyl ammonium lead iodide, as well as films of these materials which we're able to make in our lab. So once you've made nice cool crystals, it's time to characterize their optical properties with the instruments we have in this part of our lab, starting with the IR, IR instrument over here, and then we have the UV-Vis absorption spectroscopy for characterizing the band gap of the material as well as the, this instrument here for photo emission yield spectroscopy. 
continuing our tour of the instrument labs, we have SPSs here to make centered pellets. Uh, Eric is over here playing with our LFAs, which measure thermoelectric properties. We also have a laser table set up and an optical microscope. And Eugenia is here with our isotherm, which measures uh, porosity and interior surface area of a material. This is a device room. This is where we make our perovskite solar cells and other types of devices. The finished solar cell is going to look like this. You can see there are a couple of different parts to it. There's these little squares and a little rectangle. Those are the actual solar cell device components of it. The background is just the perovskite that covers the entire thing. Then we put the little bit of gold electrodes on top, or silver or aluminum, depending on what our device is, and that's how we get the final device. And each of these steps can be done in this room. The first step is going into the right device box, which is right here. If we look inside, we have all of the equipment to measure out our samples. We have solvents to dissolve them. And we have our spin coder, in which we can drop our solutions on this um, glass substrate, spin it around quickly, and get a nice thin film, and anneal it on the hot plate. Once we have all of our different layers on the substrate, we're then able to take them over to the left glove box. This is where we have our thermal evaporator. All of this is done under nitrogen, so we never have to expose the devices in air, to air at any given time. And then put them in the thermal evaporator, put a mask on top to get our nice squares and rectangles cut out, and then evaporate gold, silver, aluminum, etc. onto our devices and complete them to get a final solar cell, LED, or whatever device you want to try. And finally, once we make our devices, we have to measure them. What you see on the left is a solar simulator. This actually projects exactly the same type of light that comes from the sun onto our solar cells, which we can then connect to an electrical setup on the top right, which will then measure our efficiencies and tell us all we need to know about the devices and how we can improve them. We hope you enjoyed the lab tour and we'll see you at the poster session. Goodbye.